Hey, welcome to part two of our domestic politics of trade lecture. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to be talking about free trade agreements and industrial policy um, as two kind of specific examples of, of trade policy and, and again, sort of mapping different interest groups into support and opposition of, of these policies. Right. So we've talked about kind of in the last lecture of this story about how we get trade protection in a context where free trade is going to make the country overall wealthier. Right. And where consumers, this really broad interest group are going to benefit from lower prices and more variety. How is it that we still get where well, we still see a lot of uh, protection in individual industries? And we told this story about how a concentrated producer group uh, whose livelihoods are at stake, right, who really care about this issue uh, can end up getting their way in the democratic uh, policymaking process. Uh, over the opposition of this more diffuse interest group who all, all these people are harmed a little bit uh, by this protection, but none of whom care a ton about it, none of whom are single issue voters on that particular thing. Um, but it turns out that there are also some concentrated interests sometimes on the side of free trade, right? And that's uh, export oriented producers, right? Those are folks uh, who may not have strong preferences about whether the US protects our home market, Right, but they care about whether they can access foreign markets, right? So they really want to uh, uh, lower tariffs and lower quotas and lower subsidies in foreign markets, right? Okay, so what free trade agreements do is free trade agreements tend to be reciprocal where you let my products in, then I'll let your products in, sort of a tit for tat kind of a thing. Um, and that sort of pits a concentrated interest versus a concentrated interest because now you have the export oriented producers who really want access to those foreign markets. And so you've got this concentrated interest group who really favors negotiating a bilateral trade agreement. And then you've got this uh, concentrated interest that really opposes that agreement because they don't want to let the foreign products in, right? So now it's concentrated interest versus concentrated interest and things get real interesting, right? And, you, uh, and sometimes you see that export oriented interest winning out. Right, because they also have the consumers on their side. So it's like the exporters plus the consumers against uh, the import competing industries and sometimes the scale ends up tipping uh, in favor of free trade. So let's talk about a couple of the more recent uh, trade agreements that the US has signed. Uh, we'll start with the South Korea free trade agreement. And this was first negotiated by the George W. Bush administration, um, but then it was rejected by the Democratic controlled Senate, right? So in the US policymaking process, the executive branch negotiates treaties and signs treaties, but then they go to the Senate for ratification and they won't enter into force unless the Senate also ratifies. And in this case, the Senate refused to ratify. And the main opposition group uh, were labor unions and labor unions are obviously a very important constituency for the Democratic Party. The, Dem the Democrats controlled the Senate um, and, and a pivotal uh, union group in particular were, was the auto industry uh, that was concerned about uh, competition from South Korean auto manufacturers who were really on the rise uh, in the mid 2000s, right? Uh, Hyundai, Daewoo, um, and, and so, you know, GM, Ford, these, these companies were worried about letting uh, those cars into the United States market uh, sort of tariff free, right? So, when Obama was in office, he went back to the drawing board with that South Korean agreement and renegotiated, right? And uh, actually, you know, and struck a deal such that actually U.S. cars could enter the Korean market before Korean cars could enter the U.S. market. So to struck, it was a, yes, it was a reciprocal agreement, but one that was tilted uh, uh, in the U.S.'s favor uh, fairly steeply, particularly in the auto industry. And that was enough to get uh, the United Auto Workers on board. Right, because uh, fortunately, sort of from the US perspective, South Korea isn't just a producer of automobiles, they're also a major consumer of automobiles, right? This is an upper middle income country uh, with a lot of domestic uh, consumers who would like to buy a Ford or a, or a GM or a Chrysler product, right? Um, so accessing the South Korean market was important to the same companies that were competing uh, against uh, uh, South Korean cars in the US market. And, and the Obama administration was able to come up with a deal that the United Auto Workers Union could get on board with and with their support, then it, you know, kind of sailed through the Senate, right? Okay. So there was also a bilateral free trade agreement negotiated with Colombia um, and same kind of pattern where the Bush administration had originally uh, negotiated this, uh, the Senate had rejected it. Um, and then uh, the Obama administration comes back to it. 
renegotiates it. And this time, uh, rather than sort of getting US kind of like early access to the Colombian market, um, the negotiators were focused on improving labor rights in Colombia. So some of the complaint from US labor unions was that uh, imported products from Colombia were lower priced than American goods, uh, not necessarily just because the Colombian manufacturers were more efficient than American manufacturers, but because uh, Colombian manufacturers were repressing labor rights of Colombian workers, uh, and that was keeping prices artificially low. Um, and so uh, in both of these cases, you know, we kind of negotiated them once, the Senate rejects them, go back to the drawing table, and the reality was that the smaller countries just wanted these agreements more than the US, right? It was easier for the US to walk away from the table than, from these, than for these smaller countries, you know? And this power imbalance is really illustrated in the Colombia case where uh, the United States is Colombia's single largest trading partner, even a larger trading partner than its near neighbors, right? But Colombia only represents, uh, you know, it's less than 1% of US trade. So for the United States, they're like, eh, we could take it or leave it. But the Colombians really need this agreement. Right, which then allows the US to make very large demands. And so we talked about a couple lectures ago, sort of, okay, who gets to capture the gains from trade? And it's really nice to be a small country because sort of if we leave politics out of it, you're gonna end up trading at, um, at, your, uh, at the marginal rate of transformation of the larger country, and you're gonna capture most of the gains from trade if you're the smaller player. That's in pure economic terms with no politics. Put politics into play, and now this, there's this power imbalance where as the smaller country, you're much more dependent on trade with this larger country than vice versa. And then uh, the rules of trade in terms of like who lowers tariffs first and who has to change their own domestic policy environment more, right? I mean, can you imagine a world in which Colombia says to the United States, you need to change your domestic labor regulations before you can trade with us? That's not gonna go any, like the US is never going to do that. They don't have to. Right? We're, we're so used to being like, no, we could completely control our own domestic policy. We would never, that was insane, right? But it doesn't seem insane for us to ask that of another country. And indeed, indeed we do and did in this Colombian case. So we said, you need to change your labor laws, your domestic law in order to enter a trade agreement with us. And, and Colombia did so uh, and signed the agreement with us, right? And in the Korean case, right, that, that leverage difference sort of showed up in terms of, you know, it's just super stark where U.S. cars were able to go uh, at lower tariff rates into South Korea five years before the U.S. was going to drop tariff rates on South Korean cars into the U.S. Um, so just this real clear imbalance due to that greater ability of the United States just to walk away. All right, so that's sort of free trade agreements. And, you know, and you'll see this, you know, we'll talk, we're going to talk about the, uh, the Pacific Partnership the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which was negotiated and then, uh, and then not ratified, right? And that the Trump administration sort of finally walked away from. Um, and so we'll talk about sort of multilateral agreements versus bilateral agreements. And well, bilateral agreements are really where uh, the US can throw their weight around the most as a real large market. Um, but we throw weight around a lot in that multilateral context too. Like the US was, was driving those TPP negotiations. Um, in a similar way that they do in, in a bilateral context. Um, so political power really manifests itself in how these, uh, how these trade agreements are negotiated. Okay, but we're gonna start on this next topic, which is industrial policy. And industrial policy is one of these areas of trade protection that where we can see sometimes uh, trade protection tariffs, subsidies, quotas, that are actually probably in the national economic interest, not just protecting uh, a particular producer group because they have a uh, sort of concentrated political power or something like this. Um, it's not just a special interest story, but it can actually kind of be a national interest story. And it can even be um, kind of globally economically efficient to have trade protection. So in the simplest toy model, right, like free trade is always the most efficient uh, system. And that's the way that we can make the most goods and services in the world based on the level of technology and inputs that we currently have. But that really simple toy model relies on a lot of very strong assumptions that don't hold in practice. Um, and one of the exceptions here is that uh, industries can be hard to get off the ground. And sometimes it is actually efficient to protect an industry early on in its life to develop it to the point where it can compete globally. And where if you don't have those kind of protections for infant industries, um, you'll end up with an insufficient level and an inefficient level of competition uh, in these industries like aerospace that have really high startup costs. 
Um, so this whole idea of infant industry protection is that you, you're a country that might be able to eventually be globally competitive in a particular uh, sector, but it's going to take you a number of years to get there, right? And a single private company may not be able to make, to invest long enough and take losses long enough uh, to get up, to build up to global competitiveness. You may need government help to do that. So in industrial policy, we're generally talking about governments picking a particular industry, subsidizing it, protecting it, uh, helping it grow. Uh, and then the goal is eventually that industry is going to be globally competitive and you're going to take away those subsidies and those tariffs and those quotas and you're going to sort of pull back away from that protection and let it just sort of compete freely. Um, there's a lot of risks to doing this. Like when it works out, it can be great, but it's a very risky path, right? One is that governments are bad at picking winners, right? It's hard to pick winners in the first place. And then sometimes you have sort of essentially quasi-corruption type, type things that come in or outright corruption and lead the government to pick an industry, not because they expect it'll become competitive eventually, but just because it's owned by a key political supporter or something like that, right? Um, and then the other problem is that these temporary protections can become permanent, right? So the idea is that you're going to just protect this industry for a while, uh, and then it'll become competitive, and then you'll take these protections away. But even as that industry becomes globally competitive, they still want the additional protection, right? It's still nice to have those subsidies. Uh, and now that industry is big and powerful and employs a lot of people and has a lot of political clout, uh, and it can be hard to take those subsidies away, right? Um, you know, the firm doesn't have any incentive to kind of wean itself off of government help. And now that it actually has grown, uh, it has more political power to continue to demand those subsidies. So, um, so it can be a politically risky sort of difficult path to pursue. So we see it sometimes done really well. Um, certainly, like this is the story of, of Japanese industrialization in sort of like the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, you had super active uh, industrial policy, right, that just helped um, Japan move up the global value added chain, right? Um, we don't think about kind of the level of, you know, uh, economic production that Japan was at after World War II, but it was pretty low down uh, on the sort of uh, manufacturing pecking order and then rose really, really quickly with very active interventionist domestic policy. Um, and this was sort of orchestrated through the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. Um, they were selecting industries to receive the protection, gave a lot of subsidies for research and development, low interest loans to these governments, tax breaks, all these sort of subsidies from the government to get them up and going. And then Medi was also pretty successful once those industries are globally competitive, pulling those subsidies back away and moving on to subsidize, protect sort of the next industry that they needed to grow. And so this, you know, Japan managed to do this really quite successfully. Um, you know, and there's debates about uh, kind of on the margins about how this went. Um, and then a lot of countries sort of went to copy that. And some like South Korea have been super successful in doing it. And others, uh, you know, it's been a real train wreck and where the subsidized industries have never become globally competitive. The subsidies have never, you know, the temporary subsidies became permanent, all these kind of uh, roadblocks. And so we'll be talking about um, when we talk about development policy and we talk about how developing countries uh, use economic policy to try to become wealthier, we'll talk about uh, this active industrial policy and different flavors of it. We're going to talk about export-oriented industrialization, which is what uh, Japan and South Korea pursued, versus import-oriented industrialization, which is a different flavor of industrial policy that we sort of primarily associate with Latin American countries. Um, so we'll talk about sort of the different flavors of this and how it's worked out in different regions. Um, but I think it's helpful to give kind of like a story of a particular industry. And so let's go ahead and pick uh, the aerospace industry and the story of Airbus. Um, and so, you know, the U.S. Has, has been sort of a global leader in the aerospace industry for a very long time um, with Boeing and Lockheed Martin and um, Douglas and uh, uh, McDonnell Douglas, you know, these, these different uh, producers. And you know, in the 70s, the, the Europeans were like, you know what, we have the fundamentals in terms of the skilled workforce, the well-trained engineers, these kinds of things to be able to develop an aerospace industry, but it's going to require a lot of investment for a long time and a lot of protect protection for quite a while to get this off the ground, right? You don't go from zero to globally competitive in an industry as complex as, as aerospace um, in the span of two or three years. Like, it's just not going to happen. Um, and so, and at the time there was no one European country that felt like they could even afford to subsidize a domestic uh, aerospace industry. So it was a number of countries pooling together. 
Um, and in the first 20 years of Airbus's existence, they got 13 and a half billion in direct subsidies, as well as a bunch of kind of indirect subsidies and, and different types of protection. Um, but as expensive as it was, it was also successful, right? So by the early 90s, Airbus had an operating profit, right? And they were starting to pay back the government loans that they'd taken, right? And you, you know, and if you go hop on, uh, you know, an airline flight today, even American carriers, um, but any carrier in the world, you know, you might be flying in a Boeing, uh, Boeing jet, but you're quite likely to be flying in an Airbus uh, as well, right? You know, they've got a very large slice of that uh, global passenger jet market. Um, so, you know, again, it, it can be hard to really tally the full cost of, of all these different subsidies because some of them are direct and some of them are indirect. Uh, but, you know, I think net net, most people would sort of say, yeah, no, this, this was worth it. This was successful industrial policy that having a European aerospace industry and all the good jobs that represents and um, all the high skilled, you know, all the high skilled stuff and all the ancillary industries around that in terms of the companies making the seats and the companies making, you know, the, all the different pieces that go into these uh, jets, that, that that's, that's worth um, kind of that, those billions of dollars that, that were plowed into this industry in the first place. Um, so there continue to be really large, uh, uh, you know, uh, or in, up until quite recently when WTO dispute resolution uh, ceased functioning, um, but, but until quite recently we had these disputes between Boeing and Airbus uh, going back and forth in the World Trade Organization, um, you know, and the Europeans would say, well, the US is cheating because they use their military to subsidize all these companies, which is true, we do. You know, we plow a lot of money uh, into the US aerospace industry through the American military and, uh, you know, Boeing is saying, no, Airbus is cheating all the time because they're still getting all this protection and subsidies and they're not supposed to get that anymore and it's not fair. And Boeing is right. You know, so it's like, so both of these sides are cheating um, and, and they go back and forth uh, sort of ad nauseum. But, um, but we have now a lot more competition. Um, I mean, we have, you know, not to say like Boeing and Airbus are the only players here or the only countries that play. You know, we've got some Canadian companies that play and, and, and uh, now increasingly sort of uh, Chinese and Indian companies and, and, and other folks kind of in this space. Um, but we have a more competitive uh, aerospace, global aerospace industry than we would have had, a more efficient uh, global industry than we would have had had Europe not taken the steps to subsidize uh, Airbus. So this is a case where subsidy and protection actually enhanced long run uh, global efficiency and productivity. Um, and so that's, um, that's industrial policy for us. We'll continue to talk about that uh, in future classes. The last thing I'm going to flag in this lecture before I leave it is that all of these uh, all of these sort of mechanisms we've pointed to so far in terms of shaping individuals' preferences over trade policy have, at the end of the day, rec uh, rested on individuals' sort of rational economic self-interest, right? This sort of uh, homo economicus sort of model of, of human beings and human behavior, this idea that we we vote and support policies that put money into our own pocketbook. That's what sort of being a pocketbook voter means is that you vote in favor of candidates and policies who are going to tax you less and spend more on things that you consume and pursue policies that make you as an individual wealthier, right? But what we actually see is that human beings tend not to be direct pocketbook voters. And that while you can explain something about how somebody's going to vote by looking at what factor of production that individual owns and what industry they work in and what types of goods and services they consume. You know, so you can look at their economic characteristics and predict something, you know, like if you can figure out what's good for their pocketbook, you can explain a little bit of how they vote, but mostly actually people seem to vote based on how they expect a policy or candidate to affect their community, right? So actually if you model what's good in policy terms for somebody's zip code, you do a better job of predicting their policy preferences than if you just model what's good for them as an individual. Um, and what also seems to matter a lot in predicting individuals' preferences with respect to uh, free trade is how does that voter feel about foreigners and foreign countries in general? Uh, how do they feel about global integration writ large? So it's not just about their economic self-interest, but it's like, what are their general feelings uh, about foreigners? Like, are they xenophobic or are they very cosmopolitan? Like this sort of thing has a lot to do with predicting whether they support a particular trade agreement or not. And that's where we'll leave things today. And I look forward to chatting with you all about this uh, in person.